so as Sean introduced, uh, I'm a professor, assistant professor in HCI Institute. Uh, I joined in 2017 uh, after I graduated. Also, I'm a courtesy professor in both mechanical engineering and also material science and engineering uh, at CMU. It's kind of relevant to my talk today because you will soon notice a lot of the work I show uh, uh, need need inter interdisciplinary knowledge is from all the different fields. So the lab is called Morphing Matter Lab. And uh, why, why Morphing Matter? Um, from an HCI perspective, since Douglas um, opened and initiated this whole field of graphic interface, we started to discuss what is the more uh, natural and intuitive way to represent information. Uh, firstly, represent them on the screen. And then later, Ubiduous computing came out, and uh, a group of pioneers started to uh, wonder how we can uh, bring digital information even more intuitive bring it out of the computer screen and back to our daily life through the embedded, uh, embedded tangible interfaces. And among all these pioneers who are trying very hard to make interface more and more intuitive, uh, one of those is uh, uh, my uh, amazing uh, advisor, a PhD advisor, Professor Hiroshi Ishii. So he has a research group over MIT Media Lab called Tangible Media Group. Uh, and he has been really leading us to think about what are the a possible um, kind of ways to design more tangible and more physical interfaces to weave computation into our daily life. Uh, he and uh, Sean and many other of his PhD students have been worked very actively to bring active objects and dynamic shape-changing interfaces to uh, to represent information. Uh, and uh, after I joined uh, uh, his group, I was thinking, well, uh, all these interfaces are amazing, but eventually if you look at this magical shape-changing display, there is a gigantic monster uh, microcontroller-based um, mechanism behind the magic. Uh, and eventually, when we talk about physical computation, so we look into how nature works, how uh, our human body works, right? It functions, it actuates, it responds to the environment, it even change color and shape and being adaptive. It is a natural interface, but it does not require such sophisticated electronic powered uh, control system. So I started to wonder how we can learn from uh, our, um, uh, uh, how our body function and how natural interface, uh, how natural, natural organism function and uh, uh, try to find a branch to talk about, uh, a sub branch to talk about tangible interfaces. That's, that's where active materials uh, were born and uh, we kept working on it and now it concluded as a thread of work called morphing matter. That's why morphing matter exists. Um, and uh, we cannot talk about morphing matter without talking about nature. So these are the pine trees. I grew up with them. So I was from Inner Mongolia. After rain, I will run to the forest to pick up pine cones and mushroom as well. So uh, as a kid, I realized even for this little pine cone after rain, it's fully closed when you pick them up on the floor. But uh, you put it on the balcony for a couple of days, the, uh, all the scales will open up. And uh, the magical part is you put it back in water, you close again. So uh, soon I realized after I joined MIT, so there were a bunch of science papers talk about this interesting mechanism. It is a smart material. In a sense, it's very similar to the kind of active shape-changing mechanism Hirsch's group had been uh, really pursuing. Um, but this is uh, powered by nature. So there is no electronic components, it's completely green, and the, and the transformation behaviors are completely, uh, completely powered by, by the material itself and also the environmental condition. Uh, but it is an interface because the pine cone is responding to the rain and behaving in a certain way for the seed actually dispersal. Uh, uh, in a sense, it's an interface for, uh, for, for the life to survive itself. And I got really fascinated by uh, these kind of natural organisms and started to uh, draw a table and try to summarize all the magical transformations that can happen in nature and powered without using electricity. So you can see it ranges from the very simple bending motion to uh, sophisticated coiling and uh, volumetric expansion and contraction. Again, they are doing all these magical uh, uh, behaviors for, for very uh, different purposes 
purposes, mostly for survival. Um, and we carefully study those uh, natural organisms and start to develop more synthetic versions of those material. So in our lab, we have a fair heavy emphasis on the material development, uh, mostly inspired by nature. And uh, in order to tailor these materials to have specific uh, compositions and structure, we also are very, very into developing hardware and software design tools um, to build up the hierarchical um, transformation behaviors of the material. And uh, we really care about design applications. And uh, I think uh, part of the fun to be in the field of HCI is because we get to really imagine what the, uh, uh, what's, uh, what the future could be, what the future of life could be. So we wanted to bring those active materials into our daily life from all the way fabric to uh, robots to lampshade and to even food. So today I will bring three projects uh, that um, I was involved across uh, the past uh, few years uh, and uh, three daily materials and I will see uh, I will introduce how we are bringing this uh, kind of magical morphing behavior to these three daily materials uh, paper food and fashion so I will start with the, a very recent project uh, it's called printed paper actuator and uh, we love paper, so artists love paper too. So there are many ways you can manipulate paper to give it interesting properties for design. Folding, cutting, drawing, printing, and uh, animating. So in this project, we are looking into another uh, functionalities or characteristics we can bring to paper. That's its transformation behavior. It's very simple, three steps. Uh, first, we use this uh, commercially available printing filament. It is a graphene uh, PLA composite and just directly printed on top of a paper. So it's a very cheap filament, but it has a magical behavior. That's its uh, shape memory, uh, uh, shape memory behavior indeed. Uh, so this is what we printed. You can see it's a really thin layer of this uh, conductive filament on the paper substrate. And uh, this is a treating process as the second step. You put it in an oven, you heat it up, uh, to a certain temperature, it bends up and reach a maximum bending angle. It's like a, a treating process. And then now the paper actuator is ready to go. So you give it current, it becomes flat, and then you, 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 you cut off the current and then it bends again. And this is reversible, just like how the pine cone works. And then the, the power of design comes in. You can start to think about what are the interesting patterns you can design with this uh, animated paper structure. You can make different uh, folding mechanisms. Uh, and you can also design different, uh, you can use different construction methods. So for example, you can make a star turn, turns into a circle, or you can make uh, these kirigami structures, basically from a flat sheet, how, how things can pop up, like how pop-up pop books would work. Um, you can also design uh, different functional properties into paper. So this is a elastic property. We were looking into how to make elastic robotic legs uh, with this uh, uh, paper origami or permeability change through the uh, structural design. And uh, you can also uh, utilize the uh, functionality that uh, uh, this uh, filament being conductive to create sensors, uh, simple sensors like uh, sliding sensing or touch sensing to a more interesting sensor like self-angle sensing, etc. Uh, and uh, we can make, for example, some uh, robotic toys. Uh, it's all very, very simple to make. Uh, you just uh, design the basic stripes and combine them in different way to get different, different uh, higher level form factors. This is, is, this is another example of the caterpillar robots. And uh, you can also make synthetic plants. Uh, it responds to your touch. People may know this plant called mimosa. Uh, it behaves in a very similar way as a natural plant. If you touch it or if you hit it, it will transform. This is uh, just a, a little animated pop-up. And uh, you can also, if you are an industrial designer and love physical uh, artifacts, you can make a lampshade when you turn it on by sliding through this little stripe. Um, the, 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 
the, the, the pattern the light can change in real time. This is my favorite, by the way. It's just poetic. Think about as a little kid, you draw things on a piece of paper. But now you draw things what, with, a, with, with a pen, but whatever you draw, they can become animated right away. Um, and uh, some of my uh, students brought this technique to a, uh, to, a, um, to a design college this summer, and they ran a workshop with the topic, what is a book? Uh, with this uh, printed paper actuators. So these are some of the outcomes from the, uh, from the, uh, from the workshop. So for me, it's just really interesting, uh, uh, interesting to see how a simple technology with some smart design can bring a lot of magic to life and empower designers to think about graphic design from a very different perspective. So in the lab, we sometimes work on really tricky materials. You need to use very sophisticated, uh, uh, for example, uh, fabrication machines to make a nanostructure. But we are also super interested in investigating uh, widely accessible material. There is a power in terms of using very available materials to empower more people to be able to explore it. This is one of these examples. Def definitely have that democratizing aspects. And uh, I wanted to draw a bit of a lesson to share with you guys in terms of how to engineer different materials to have this morphing behavior. So usually we have three secret ingredients. The first is stimuli. People are asking, you are not using electricity uh, uh, necessarily. What could be the stimuli? As long as you want things to move, you need energy. Uh, if it's not electricity, it must be something else. Rain or temperature fluctuation. So stimuli is uh, an important component component and also composition. Remember I showed you guys uh, a lot of interesting origami structures we engineered. We are very, very interested in investigating hierarchical structure design when we engineer different transformation. Um, and also, of course, we care about the property, the elasticity, the permeability we are bringing uh, through the transformation is kind of the design goal. So we kept this in mind whenever we engineer different materials. So take uh, this paper actually as an example. The stimuli is the heat. In this case, it's resistive, resistive heating. The composition is the way we are printing different patterns on top of the paper. And the property is the bending. It's the bending primitives that we are able to engineer. And this is a universal lesson I share with my students, uh, regardless the material they are looking into. And uh, it's uh, widely adaptable, adaptable to different contexts as well. For example, when my grandma make a big balloon in the bread in the kitchen, she's also using the similar principle. There's energy coming from the hot oil, and then there is this exp expansion energy caused the transformation with the purpose of a shape-changing bread in this case. Uh, and she also tells me uh, when the dumplings are floating on top of water, it, it means the dumpling is done. So in this case, think about it. It is the water as energy to cause the inner expansion of a piece of a dumpling, and the goal of the dumpling floating on top is because the dumpling wants to tell you, hey, I'm ready. A dumpling becomes an interface. So it's just fascinating to think how, how you can uh, expand the interpretation of interface once you started to look into uh, the physical media or the physical materials. So uh, that really brought us to think about uh, kitchen as a possible context to explore morphing matter. Uh, if you think about a kitchen, Mm, we, uh, we have different types of stimuli when you are cooking food, right? You are frying, baking, you are boiling, uh, and uh, we have many, many properties we really care or we wanted to go very geeky to manipulate, including flavors, shape, the crunchiness, the surface texture of your croissant. Uh, and uh, for material scientists, this is a really interesting context, and for interface designer as well. Um, that really brought us uh, actually a bunch of uh, PhDs from both MIT and uh, currently at Carnegie Mellon to cook. Uh, and uh, I will introduce uh, a second project called Transformative Appetite. Uh, and uh, I started to work on it with a lot of my collaborators back at MIT. And we are, brought, uh, we are bringing it to CMU as well for further development. So apparently, there is a long history for people to uh, manipulate the physical properties of food and call them interfaces, all the way from color change to texture 
other changes. And uh, we are looking into a very interesting property called, uh, or actually indeed also very, uh, um, a very widely um, uh, observable property called the hydration property of material. So this is a piece of starch. When you put it in water, the starch will swell and cause the change of, um, of its volume. Everybody knows about it. When you cook a piece of pasta, so the pasta will grow fatter. That's what's going on. And that's the phenomenon we are looking into. So uh, if you go a little bit deeper to understand uh, uh, all kind of different edible components um, that your food are made of. You can think about agar, gelatin, starch, cellulose, and all of uh, these ingredients to some extent absorb water and hydrate, but they have a different hydration rate. Um, and uh, now we can do something interesting. So if you uh, put a piece of um, edible uh, sheets, but then you print Another edible material, but has a different swelling rate. Uh, you can engineer a flat piece of uh, food, but once you cook them in water, they, they, they start to bend. So again, it's a pine cone. Um, and this is just a scanning electron microscopic image to show you how the density actually varies uh, for the food sample we made. Um, and this is, again, a microscopic image. You see the center part of the food grow much slower than the edges. Uh, that's because the center part is made of a cellulose and gelatin composite, while the edges are purely made of gelatin. Uh, you can, I, I'll play this again, so if you pay attention, this, this, the, the center part rises much slower than the edge. This, by the way, is exactly how nature uh, taught us to do. The pine cone can open up in a very specific curvature. It's all because nature grows its composition in a very particular way. Uh, and you can do something fancier. So now if you try to make a more complex composite with the cellulose printed on top of the composite, you can engineer way more complex behavior. For example, you can transform a disc into a potato chip shape once you cook them. And you can go even more sophisticated to control the composition ratio of the cellulose and gelatin to get different, uh, different degrees of saddle, uh, saddle shape in this case. And you can make a flat disc turn into a flower as well as you cook it. So I'll explain a little bit of the fabrication process um, behind this project. So we envisioned the, the idea of a shape-changing pasta. And in this case, we prepared a flat film that's made of gelatin, it's a gel. Um, and then we 3D printed, uh, 2D print, 2D printed cellulose lines uh, on top of the gelatin film we prepared beforehand. This is just a software to help you simulate if you combine the cellulose uh, and the gelatin film in different way, what are the possible shapes you can get. And these are the real pasta. As you cook them, they start as flat. Uh, after 10 minutes, they take on different shape. I said pasta with quotation because they are made of uh, gelatin and cellulose. They taste like jello, uh, crunchy jellos. But anyway, so you can see there are a lot of shapes you can, you can self-assemble. Um, and uh, some of them look like a, a traditional pasta, but some of them are actually very hard to make if you use conventional pasta manufacturing technique. Um, and uh, by the time uh, when we were working uh, on this project with Target, we really, uh, we really were trying to push the concept that this will save their packaging space. So we did a sophisticated calculation to show how much packaging space you can save if you make all your pasta flat. Uh, and we ended up working with a French cuisine chef uh, over Boston. Uh, it's called Espalier, uh, and uh, it's one of the fanciest uh, French cuisine restaurants in Boston area. So he put some of the uh, customized flavor into our shape-changing uh, materials and made, for example, mushroom flowers and uh, squid ink based uh, uh, coiled shape. And he also plated, plated some of the dishes. They were very interested in introducing these uh, shape changing performances in real time in a fine dining uh, uh, context. 
it's amazing to see he basically just played with our material and came out with all the dishes almost on the fly. It's a video shot purposely, but uh, really he didn't do any rehearsals. Uh, this is my favorite, by the way. It's a flat film. If you put it in uh, to uh, uh, water, it will wrap all the caviar around it and form a little wrap. So my original motivation to work on this project is shape-changing, uh, actually self-folding dumplings. Because every time I go home, my mom will spend hours and hours to make me dumplings. Uh, this is just a, uh, but dumplings are really hard to make. So this is just a uh, one step towards self-folding dumpling. <laughs> and this is another really interesting one. So it's a noodle. If you cook it for a shorter time, it stays long. But if you cook them for longer, it will self-chop into a smaller pieces. Imagine you can cook um, both for yourself, who like long noodles for texture, and your kids who like shorter ones for easier digestion within one pot. So again, talk back about the interfaces. When a, when a film wraps things around it, when a pasta can be its own timer, and based on the needs to program its own shape, we are talking about interfaces. We are talking about interfaces that are pre-programmed with very very different conditions and specific behaviors. Uh, and why, why pasta? Why pasta? Um, we, we really care about shape manipulation. We sourced all kinds of food around the globe and realized Italians are super specific about the shape of pasta. We'll better demonstrate our uh, powerful shape-changing grammars by looking into pasta. So I uh, ended up visit the Barilla. Barilla, I guess everybody knows uh, it's uh, one of the biggest Italian uh, pasta manufacturer in Milan uh, last year. And uh, I presented what we did at MIT and I said, hey, um, what if we collaborate? You guys are cool. We are cool. We're going to really make this pasta into the market. Although now it tastes like gel, I have an idea how to make it uh, taste like real pasta. And I also showed this diagram. It shows basically macaroni pasta compared to the flat ones can, um, can actually waste 67.3% of the packaging space. Um, and, uh, and also, if you pack pasta in 3D shape, they are very fragile. They can break very easily. And also, I told them this is a great selling point just for marketing reason. And I got them convinced, and they started to sponsor us. And not only with money, but also Italian-grown, authentic semolina flour. And we've been shipping it uh, many times to our lab for the past year. And uh, uh, and I again, I also showed them, you know, you not only can sell this in supermarket, but then you can also put the, put them into your Barilla kitchen as fine dining experiences and potentially get us to mountain hikers, disaster sites, or even space travel in the future. So they're, they they they. Now now are very convinced they are working with us, and these are the newest uh, newest uh, outcome. What you see here, I'm very proud. Uh, it's real pasta, so they are purely made of semolina flour and water, and uh, they uh, they are using a completely different mechanism in terms of transformation. We soon are having a paper out. Um, not sure where it goes, but we are targeting more scientific uh, journal publication and trying to convince them the transformation mechanism behind it is actually more universal. But pasta can be uh, one of those design cases. So. Before, it's a street noodle. If you cook it, it turns into a instant noodle uh, with coiled shapes. But you can, of course, do more sophisticated things. Um, these are just four examples we, we, we showed to Barilla. Actually, um, their, their um, researchers over the Italian headquarter were able to replicate all of this. And uh, they are getting an exclusive licensing from CMU. Super exciting, so it means they are very serious to get it, this into the market. And we uh, our group did a hiking trip uh, a few months ago, and this is uh, the leading author on this paper herself cooking it uh, outdoor and trying to eat some of this. Um so yeah, so it's really edible now. Uh, and uh, through this journey of the past year working with Barilla, we also figured this uh, is more universal than just uh, just uh, cooking. Uh, sorry, than, than just uh, being boiled. You can also bake it. So these are the uh, sort of uh, Japanese wagashi flour you bake it through baking, you can transform it into 3D. It's getting closer and closer to my dream of self-folding dumplings, for sure. Uh, and these, again, they are all self-assembled uh, self food. 
and uh, we try to sell it to Mexico <laughs> and say, you know, you can make self uh, self wrapping tacos. So these were all produced flat, and uh, if you bake it, it wrap itself, and then we stuff them afterwards. So yeah, so we are getting really excited again about this project because the general mechanism we figured is not only ap applied to a flour, but also to hydrogels, uh, to uh, to silicone, so it could have wider usage for for health and medical and soft robots in general as well. And it, this mechanism is a cross scale. It could potentially work for nano robots or micro robots at least. Um, so we are working on that. And the last project, the big project I wanted to explain, again, it came out of my PhD thesis two, uh, one year ago. Um, it's uh, called biologic. So this way, the, in this case, we're actually transforming the third type of uh, a material that's a living material. Uh, it's, a P, uh, it's, it's actually a special bacteria. And this is what we made out of the bacteria uh, hybrid material. So this sweat responsive garment is secretly powered by this specific bacteria that's only one tenth the diameter of your, your hair. It's called Bacillus subtilis natto bacteria. Uh, and uh, it's a very interesting bacteria because it's edible and it rooted itself in a long history of uh, Japanese samurai. So apparently one day the samurai, uh, almost uh, 10,000 years, uh, 8,000 years ago, so they were on a battle and carried some soybeans in a dry rice stock made bag, and uh, he tasted the soybean and uh, felt it was much more tasty than the soybean he used to taste. Uh, and later on, they figured that was because the bacteria hiding inside this dry rice stock um, fermented the soybean. And uh, so, so the, 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 the Japanese name of this bacteria actually called dry rice stock bacteria. The direct translation into English is, uh, yeah, it's natto, it's basically subtilis or natto bacteria. So if you go to Japan nowadays, it's a uh, it's a classic breakfast. You uh, you get this soil being super sticky, uh, and uh, if you put this under a microscope, actually they are full of bacteria like that. This, this is a microscope image we we uh, we uh, we. Uh, we we were able to capture. So we are leveraging this Asian bacteria for its new function. So we found out this bacteria can be really sensitive to the moisture condition in the environment, expand and contract based on, based on the relative humidity. So yeah, it's a nano actuator in a sense. Uh, and uh, if you deposit thousands or millions of those nano actuators on a piece of fabric, they started to behave like a pine cone again. So <laughs> if, you, uh, if you increase the relative humidity becomes flat, and if you decrease the humidity, it bends up. And uh, remember my whole uh, idea of uh, stimuli composition? So here is the composition trick. So if you started to print the bacteria in parallel lines in very different ways, you can manipulate the biohybrid material to have different transformative function. In this case, responding to the relative humidity is super, super sensitive. You, if you put it on your skin, the little micro moisture environment around your body can already actuate this uh, bacteria. So we ran to New Balance and thought, hey, we're finding a killer app uh, for, uh, for your sports garment. We wanted to make sweat responsive uh, uh, garment. New Balance headquarters was uh, about half an hour away drive from uh, MIT. So yeah, so they give us uh, a lot of heat map and also a lot of devices of how to make fabric composite. This is what we came out. So these are two uh, uh, functional performative fabric uh, made garment and it responds to your body condition. Mm. 
So when you are when you are uh, when you are dry uh, and cold, all the scales on the back of your body will close, and uh, when you get sweaty and hot, uh, all the flaps will open up. It's self-tunable. Again, it's a it's an interface, and there is a computational loop, but it's happening within the material. It understands the environment. In this case, your body condition, and try to tune things in real time and response in real time. And it's just been really fascinating to think about how you can interpret the whole idea of action and reaction in an interface loop uh, from a material perspective. This is a close shot of how these uh, scales actually look like when your body is sweaty. Um, and uh, this is the process of how we prepared, how we prepared the bacteria. Um, and uh, I, when I worked on this project, I was always excited by the idea that we are making actuators, but we are making actuators in a wet lab. We are growing them uh, instead of, you know, buying electromagnetic motors in the market or astringent to customize the, the stuff for us. And one actuator can grow into a billion overnight, so it came uh, as a free energy. Uh, this is just atomic force microscope to image how the bacteria is changing in its volume as I'm blowing on top of it. I'm using a straw blowing a breathing on, on the bacteria as, it, as you can observe the transformation of it. Uh, and then we load the bacteria solution, we prepare it overnight onto a, uh, a syringe extruder. This is a customized printer to deposit the bacteria line by line on, on a piece of uh, elastomeric substrate. It's a silicone substrate, um, a safer body, you can wear it. And depends on how you are printing it, you can control uh, the sensitivity of the transformation and also the geometry of the transformation. So we ended up working with uh, two dancers from Boston Ballet Company, uh, and these were just the uh, a dance piece that the, uh, the they helped us to shoot uh, and demonstrate how the bacteria behave. So here we actually uh, integrate the lesson we learned from New Balance. So they gave us the heat map, so all the patterns are computationally designed to address the, uh, the body part that's easily to sweat. And uh, we tuned the sensitivity of the fabric by uh, controlling the density of the bacteria and also the thickness of the bacteria. So we make sure you don't get too cold. <laughs> So no doubt there are a lot of engineering works and also there are a lot of uh, back and forth communication between the fashion designer who designed the garment and also the bioengineer collaborator who are, who are raising the cell. Uh, but in general, I think it's a really great lesson to see how the merging of disciplines can actually inspire both sides. So for example, when we started to work with the dancers, the, uh, they were all really professional dancers at that point, um, but they still said they were so inspired by the fact that they are carrying living uh, things on their back and started to almost uh, create their own dance movement and uh, we were very inspired by their comments and decided to make an art exhibition called Dancing with Billions of Bacteria. Uh, and you can see their expressive motions are tailored almost to, uh, to, to living, to, to the fact that, you know, some things are living. So these exhibitions were curated uh, for the two sides of uh, almost uh, world view uh, or the view of making, so the made and the born world. Uh, these are the sculpt uh, sculptures we made for the exhibition and uh, a fun video to document the exhibition. You will see my advisor Hiroshi uh, in this video too. So again, so bacteria uh, it's very hard to control, so there were a lot of frustration just, uh, you know, to, to tame 
them to behave in the way we want. Uh, and printer is one way to, to tame them, basically make their geometric patterns. So we wanted to, through this exhibition to open up the discussion how uh, synthetic chromatic manipulation and natural growth can, can coexist. So here you see all those patterns are very precisely printed, so they behave exactly as how we predicted in our software. Uh, but then on the other side of this exhibition, these are naturally grown patterns and bacteria got to express the way they want. Uh, so there is a, a balance of the beauty in that as well. And even the sculpture, it's a precisely wire sculpture frame with this organic bacteria transforming in the way they want it at the back. And we also invited the dancers for the opening event. So they did a live performance. They were not sweating because this was only three minutes. So we have steamers on the side that shoots to their body and make them transform. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. Um, so later we, uh, we, we thought we should uh, publish some, this, this work in more serious uh, <laughs> community because we do think the idea of leveraging a, uh, a, a living bacteria uh, for the sake of a nano actuation could be more universal or could be more adaptable to a scientific community. So we started to work on this idea of genetically modified nano actuator. If you use a living bacteria, you can genetically uh, engineer the DNA to put multifunctionality into the bacteria. For example, we made a bacteria that could actuate as well as glow, and both glowing and also actuation respond to uh, the moisture. Um, it was published eventually at the Science Advances. Um, so the idea is you can, you can, yeah, again, so you can make a, a synthetic material, biohybrid material that can glow more and more intensively as it actuates in response to uh, the increase in moisture. So this is the shoe we made. Now the shoe can not only open up to get rid of your sweat, but also a glow as you are running in dark. Uh, we, uh, yeah, this is a close shot of the glowing bacteria actuator. We uh, did an exhibition later on also at Centre Pompidou in Paris, just to show uh, a, a glowing sculpture. And uh, um, since I'm in the School of Computer Science, and since I am hired by a School of Computer Science nowadays, uh, after I left Media Lab, I really wanted to ask the question of why computer science, and also more and more of my students at CMU are into the whole idea of computation behind the physical materials we're manipulating. So I just wanted to quickly give a few examples of the recent work uh, we are doing, which integrate more of a CS perspective. Think about a piece of flower. We wanted to morph the flower on the left hand to uh, the flower on the right hand. So it's a, basically a flat piece uh, that can self-assemble into a rose. Uh, it's uh, intuitively uh, feasible, but uh, it's getting really hard for me to compute, even as an experienced morpher. Uh, and this turns out to be the layers and also the specific angles you need to program into each hinge and also each pedal that are, that are, that, that are going outwards. We started to see the necessity of uh, a developing more sophisticated design tools for the kind of materials we are interested in and the kind of morphing behaviors we are interested in, thinking if you wanted to you know, self-assemble this classic Stanford bunny, uh, what is the inverse uh, computational pipeline to even, to, to even uh, design the flat shape to have it self-fold uh, back into a Stanford bunny. So this is a tool that we developed and uh, we published this work already, so if you guys are interested in, uh, you mean, uh, replicating it, uh, it's actually quite, quite fun because the, um, the tool is compatible with MakerBot. <laughs> uh, you can literally do this in your lab and, and uh, also design your own shapes as well. Um, but uh, not only origami, we are also interested in double curvature shapes, basically those smooth, more organic shapes, and they are getting harder computationally. For example, this chair surface, we wanted to morph a flat piece into a self-assembled organic chair surface. Um, 
by the way, the motivation is we want to sell this to IKEA. Uh, imagine the furniture, the, the save billions of dollars uh, by making flat pack. Um, but then once it's at your home, you have to manually assemble them. More beautiful shapes take more of your time to assemble. So we want you to make big furniture. When you plug into the wall, they self-assemble into uh, very expressive shapes on the fly. So, but in order to make more organic shapes, we need to think about the, what, uh, what's the inverse, uh, inverse computational algorithms to enable this to happen. So this is one of the examples we published in WIST last year, 2018. Uh, um, basically, you can make each beam shrink in a very specific ratio, um, and uh, then you can back calculate the desired 3D shape you will get. And these tools are all tailored to uh, the final um, print to path. And uh, what about an armor? And you can again also back calculate what is the best uh, desired bending angle or shrinkage ratio for each beam in order to get the final shape you want. So this is the tool behind, behind uh, what I just showed as organic shapes. Uh, you want a leaf and uh, then you can input the shape of the leaf so the software will help you to compute all the shrink ratio needed for each beam and turn it into print two path and you can um, you can export the two path and uh, eventually print it out as a flat piece if you put it in water it should it should morph uh, as uh, what you inputted at the very beginning from the software so reality is always harder than uh, the imagination. Um, it turns out if it's a pure geometric calculation, uh, it never gives you the more the most precise uh, precise prediction because their gravities, their physical material, they're getting softer as they transform, their torsional forces, you know, shearing, uh, everything is affecting the accuracy of simulation. So a group of my students are working on actually leveraging machine learning and finite element analysis to make the simulation more accurate. Our big, big vision is to be able to uh, to design and simulate morphing structures regardless of the type of material uh, in real time to empower everybody to design design morphing morphing behaviors for the context they're interested in. So this is another example we're going to talk about in Kai 2019 this year. Uh, 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 this is uh, play with the dimension. We talk about 2D sheets transform into 3D. What about 1D? 1D line turn into 3D. So we are printing uh, basically you know, all those uh, voxel per voxel co co um, combinations of shrinkage behaviors into a single line. Uh, and then you can uh, inversely design the shape it will transform into as you trigger them with heat or water. Um, oh, sorry, I need to go back a little bit. Yeah, it's quite fun to, to think about um, the, 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 the limit of the dimensionality you could, you could decrease for morphing materials. Um, and you can also design different compliant mechanisms in, in this case. Once you transform them into different shapes, you can start to play with them and they become little tools. And uh, this is almost at the end of my talk. So the possibilities are limited, uh, unlimited, I hope. At least that's, that's one lesson I, I, I hope I managed to share. But uh, go back to the original question and ask again, why morphing matter? Why morphing matter? So I, I, I've been thinking. Uh, it, we can technically do everything, um, but uh, what makes sense to spend our uh, lifetime for? So I, I have this strong belief, maybe partially infused by Professor Hiroshi and all the pioneers who are working with tangible and uh, physical medium, that uh, no matter how uh, much advance, advancement we are getting uh, in terms of the computational technologies, we can never leave our physical environment. Um, and uh, you know, you you uh, you compute on Twitters and Twitters and all the social network become 
become a learning system and adapt, adapt to your needs? What if we can also make a shoe for your daughter and uh, as she grow and older and older, the shoe can learn and adapt to the size and needs and aesthetic uh, demands of your daughter. So, and also, um, you know, uh, no matter how, uh, how fast the virtual reality or even augmented reality technology are advancing, how fascinated we are by the idea of living in this virtual environment. Eventually, you, after work, you go home, you sit on a physical couch, you eat your physical food. Um, as an interaction designer, I think I almost feel obligated to uh, remind people to not forget the physical, physical environment, and that's the beauty of our life. But uh, you know, also as a technologist, I wanted to make sure I'm not going back to the ancient life. We wanted to use our knowledge to empower the imaginations of interfaces. That's why morphing matter should exist. Um, and uh, how to morph matter? So if we think about this uh, whole interdisciplinary statement for HCI researchers, we used to merge electrical engineering, mechanical engineering, computer sciences, design and art all together to create uh, uh, HCI research, um, but uh, with the whole uh, motivation of engineering morphing matter, we need to bring um, more interdisciplines, interdisciplines into our radar. Uh, that includes material science, chemistry, mechanics, right, and advanced manufacturing, and computational tools, and even biological engineering. We are very, very interested in potentially using DNA to engineer uh, material properties at an uh, even lower, lower scale. Actually, we are kind of working on that. Um, so if you guys are interested in knowing more of uh, the possibilities of morphing matters, we're having five papers at CHI this year, 2019. Um, and we, uh, we talk about, in my talk, paper, plastic, food, and bacteria as potential morphing matter candidates. And we are bringing more uh, into our big family. So we are thinking of you know, foam, thread, hydrogels, and uh, silicone, and even 3D knitted goods as potential candidates for morphing matter. So I I'm very interested in uh, seeing uh, and also discussing these projects uh, with, uh, with, with you guys. And I wanted to end my talk with this uh, inspiring um, statement from actually Leonardo da Vinci. So in order to make uh, pure creations that merge technology and also your imagination, um, it's important to think about the integration of artificial and natural world, art and science, reality and fantasy, as well as the experiences and imagination. And uh, I appreciate everybody's time to be here. And this is my amazing team is growing very rapidly every day. I feel I'm overwhelmed by their creativity. Um, and uh, yeah, you guys are welcome to visit us. It's uh, in Pittsburgh. Thank you.